Okay, uh, welcome back to the machine learning infrastructure data. Today, uh, we get to finally uh, start connecting a bunch of pieces together uh, into something that sort of, uh, I think, will emerge into a really elegant uh, way of representing a lot of different models. Um, so, so far, we've just kind of been going through Bayesian networks, but we're going to move beyond them uh, to start to talk about uh, families of models that include Markov random fields and conditional random fields. So, uh, before we get there, I do want to kind of wrap up a few details with BayesNets, though. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, so, does anybody have a uh, question? Me of this, and I thought I had solved it. So, according to my script, I have uploaded the slides. Um, but, oh, okay, uh, I probably have some sort of like compiler error in Jekyll or something. Okay, so sorry about that. Um, I'll get to you up right after class. Um, in general, anytime something like that happens, definitely uh, just let me know, because I usually don't. Um, so one question that came up was, uh, how long are there in those 5% participation points? Um, so very gradually, there will be like a, a few small aspects of the course that will involve your participation, uh, maybe more if you're in 618 doing a, a project, and um, we'll attach some participation points to them. That said, you might not actually use the whole 5%. Uh, it's just useful to kind of hold out uh, some space in case we need it. Uh, and in that case, uh, we'll just say that you get points for being you. And, uh, <laughs> and the whole class gets curved upwards. OK, so um, uh, another really good question uh, that's a little bit early uh, is why would I uh, prefer a directed graphical model over an undirected one? <coughs> we had sort of scribbled a picture of an underdirected graphical model. We haven't yet defined it. Um, but what we'll see today is that there are some really big differences that you should be watching out for uh, between these kinds of models. And uh, the, the two that I want you to keep an eye out for are conditional independence assumptions and a distinction of how the model is normalized. How do we ensure that it actually gives probabilities that sum to one? OK, and um, we'll do some. Uh, some nice tying together of these two kinds of models into factor graphs. Uh, but I guess the real answer is going to be that there are going to be some practical differences, like the ease of learning for different kinds of models in different kinds of settings. Um, and a lot of those stem from uh, whether the model is locally or globally normalized. So uh, we won't actually see that difference until maybe a lecture or two from now when we really uh, get into the meat of, of how it is we learn undirected graphical models. Uh, but that, that distinction will start to emerge. So this is just kind of a picture of uh, some important details about where we're going. OK, so there's a reminder about the dagger homework. OK, so I want to just sort of briefly highlight how we can go about supervised learning for a Bayesian network. OK, so. Uh, uh, there's lots, what we'll find is that there are lots of ways of learning uh, a model. And here I just want to highlight how we could do maximum likelihood estimation of a Bayesian network. Okay. So this is just sort of a, a standard recipe for maximum likelihood estimation. We say that uh, we're going to assume that we have uh, data points that are these xi vectors, and they're drawn from some distribution p of x given theta. Now, uh, if you are someone who really wants to do uh, sort of conditional predictive modeling, right, you really like that running part of speech tag example, uh, then you could think of this as, well, we're also conditioning on some additional side information, 
like a description of a sentence, in order to obtain uh, that XI, which is, say, a sequence of times. Uh, or we might be in, a, be in a situation where our model actually defines fully where the entirety of our data comes from. So for example, maybe we have a topic model that describes where uh, each individual document in some large collection of documents came from. So each document is now some XI. And, uh, and what we want to do is uh, actually write down uh, some log likelihood of the actual data samples that we have, which is just the sum of the log probability of each example. Okay, so then from there, we're going to assume that our parameters theta are some vector, and so we're going to compute partial derivatives uh, with respect to each parameter in that vector, theta 1, theta 2, up to theta m. And, you know, if we just put little brackets around those partial derivatives, well then, great, now we have a gradient. And, okay, so this is just now the gradient of the uh, likelihood with respect to that vector theta. Okay. And uh, we could then set that gradient, which is a vector equal to the zero vector, and solve for theta. And the resulting theta, when we do this, would be the maximum likelihood estimate uh, uh, to that likelihood. And um, so there is this kind of important question, which is, can we even solve analytically for theta at all? And um, so, but assuming you can, then uh, you could also then compute the second derivative and check that uh, the log likelihood is concave down at the point you just found. Okay. All right, so this is just a, a generic recipe that hopefully you've seen before. Um, in the very first equation, you have conditioning on theta, right? Are there some models where you don't have conditioning on any kind of parameters? Oh, uh, are there models? Uh, where you don't condition on any sort of parameters. Sure, uh, here's one. Um, oh man, no, that has parameters. Uh, that's, <laughs> um, uh, so we could say. Um, yeah, but even but random. So the the example of it. Let's let's see. Uh, let's see. Let's let's start <laughs> getting examples here. Um, so uh, so for example. Uh, the thing that, that immediately came to mind that is not a good example is uh, we can say, uh, you know, the value of x is sampled from a uniform distribution. Oh, but we need to say what it's uniform over uh, and its parameters. Uh, well, maybe like a coin flipping distribution, you know, uh, but then that Bernoulli distribution, it always, it always has that parameter p, right? Um, so does anyone have a, a distribution that truly has no parameters? Uh, so the histogram, uh, the actual, you know, so we could draw like a little picture of a histogram here and say that the values are either A, B, or C, right? But really, this is actually equal to a multinomial distribution parameterized by some vector phi, which tells us the height of each of those little bars. Like, what if you have like a lot of data and you just sample from that data? Now you're not parameterizing your distribution. You just have. Data. Yeah. So here now, what we're sort of saying is, uh, let's say that X is sampled from a uniform distribution over a set D. It doesn't even really matter what that set is, right? And now, uh, this is a essentially non-parametric distribution because uh, we're saying that. Uh, the actual distribution is defined by some set. Um, so, uh, so in this case, uh, we've we've kind of achieved sort of what uh, what an, an algorithm like say k nearest neighbor does, which is it doesn't have its own parameters. It's a non-parametric model, but it relies on uh, an actual data set. Uh, so there always needs to be some specification, though 
of, of what the actual distribution is. And there was actually, sort of, there's actually a typo in here, uh, in my assumption. Did anybody <coughs> We're assuming that this, these xi's come from some distribution. There's typically some additional bit of notation that we throw in here. We usually want to flag the fact that this theta here is not just any theta, it's like some unknown theta. Maybe it's called theta star. Or if we didn't want to call it theta star, we could have talked about some uh, distribution p star from which these examples were drawn. Uh, but the point is that the, the actual distribution from which we're uh, sampling this is unknown. Uh, but here we're assuming that uh, the actual uh, model family, or the, the, the actual model itself, is maybe the same uh, as that of our, uh, the model that we're learning. So if you know the model family, then why is why are the derivatives why do the derivatives not have a continuous form? Oh, if we know yeah, what? if we know the functional form, then there should be a analytical description. Great question. So can anyone think of a functional form of a probability distribution for which we can't come up with a closed form solution? All seen one before. Naive Bayes would not be an example. <laughs> so we can really write it down as a reason. Something else? Well, what if it's a piecewise probability distribution which we define? So derivatives won't be there at the transition terms? Uh, yeah, so. Uh, yeah, this is a fine example. It wasn't the, quite what I was thinking of. Um, so if it's a piecewise distribution, then um, I guess the, the catch there is we may actually, uh, we might actually be able to, uh, to still identify it in closed form. Um, so I was thinking of a different situation. Yeah, a deep neural network. That'd be a great example. It doesn't need to be that deep, though. We could also just have said uh, binary logistic regression. This is a model for which we know, you know, sigma, uh, where sigma is the sigmoid function of theta transpose x, uh, is a, a model that, you know, we could write down and we could assume that the data came from it. Uh, but there's not going to be a closed form solution to its maximum, the maximum likelihood estimates for its parameters. So, uh, so this is this is sort of, yeah. Uh, sorry. But there will be just it's going to be computationally expensive. Is that what you're saying? Oh, uh, so yes, yeah. yes. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So I guess in general, uh, we might be able to write down a closed form, but. Uh, okay we can't actually uh, compute it, for example. OK. So what if we wanted to apply this recipe to a Bayes net? OK, well, um, then what we're really trying to do here is you know, tune the parameters of the model such that we get good parameters, where the definition of good comes from our definition of uh, our objective function being maximize the likelihood of the data, or the log likelihood equivalently. Okay, and so, uh, you know, this is one recipe, but uh, maybe a more general recipe would have said something in step four, instead of, you know, solving in closed form, we could have solved by gradient descent. Okay, the point is that we're just trying to optimize some objective function. Okay, so, uh, but the reason that I, I, I gave the example uh, in closed form is because for a Bayes net, we you often can actually uh, solve this learning problem uh, in a really easy way. And uh, so the goal here is to, uh, to actually learn uh, the parameters of these distributions. Okay. And so uh, there's sort of an interesting point here, which is that 
uh, we need to actually identify what is the parameterization of our Bayesian network. Okay, so what I mean by that is uh, if we're talking about parameterization of our Bayes net, then there's actually a lot of options available to us. And, uh, you know, one of them is uh, some conditional probability tables. But we could also do other things. We could have, say, a parameterization that assumes maybe all of our variables are uh, real valued. So this, this would maybe be appropriate if we have uh, discrete valued variables. But then uh, what if instead we had real valued variables? How could we parameterize in that case? I saw an example of this last time. Yeah, maybe you could just pick your favorite probability distribution. Mine today is Gaussian, and so we could say we have Gaussian distributions for, uh, for all of our variables. But, you know, maybe you don't like Gaussians for some reason, uh, and so instead, you know, you still have real valued random variables, and you know, you're just the kind of person who wants a Laplace distribution uh, for each of your variables. Or maybe some mixture of these things, right? Okay. So uh, there's lots of different options available to you when you think about the actual parameterization. But what we want to identify here is whether the conditional independence assumptions of the graph inform how learning decomposes. Okay. So let's look at what happens. So turns out that with a fully observed Bayesian network, so now the, the important point here is that when we say fully observed, what we mean is that our training examples actually include all the variables in the graph. Okay. So when our training examples include all the nodes in the graph, then learning the entire graph is equivalent to learning, uh, say, a collection of independent graphs. Okay. And you can get those by uh, decomposing into one graph per term in our joint distribution. Okay, so, so there's one little graph for the term corresponding to x1, p of x1. There's one for x2, which is p of x2 given x1. There's one for x3. There's one for x4 and one for x5. Okay. So if we can just figure out how to independently learn the parameters for each of these little graphs, uh, then whatever we come up with will actually be uh, the correct answer for the whole graph. Okay, so why does that work? Well, uh, what we can see is that um, if we had exactly one training example, okay, corresponding to a single assignment to these five variables, right? then the log likelihood is kind of boring. It consists of just one term for that one training example. Right? So it would be that, you know, the, I guess I shouldn't call this theta star. I should call this uh, theta hat. Right? It's our uh, maximum likelihood estimate. And we're going to say that uh, finding the parameters that maximize that is equivalent to finding the parameters that maximize the sum of the log probabilities uh, for each of the terms in our joint probability distribution, right? We just took the log of that product on the previous slide, and then the log takes that product and, and makes it a bunch of sums of logs. Okay. But if the parameters decompose such that there's parameters unique to each of those terms, right? There's a parameter for the x5 term, there's a parameter theta 4 for the x4 term, and so on. Then uh, the maximum likelihood estimates are just uh, those which maximize uh, 
the likelihood for each of those individual terms. Okay. So what's interesting about this statement is that it has nothing to do with the parameterization that we chose. This is true whether uh, these probabilities are defined to be Gaussian or to be uh, conditional probability tables or Laplace distributions or whatever your favorite distribution is. Okay, so now let's come back to that uh, tornado alarm example from last time. And we can see here uh, that um, uh, we have, as before, uh, some random variables where uh, I guess I dropped one uh, corresponding to uh, whether or not there was a fire, just to kind of clean the slide up here. And um, so we just have whether or not a tornado occurred, whether or not hackers compromised the system, whether or not the alarm went off, and whether or not there were 100 plus 911 calls. And the way that I actually parameterized it was to say that uh, this H variable uh, comes from uh, an actual Bernoulli distribution with parameter eta. Okay. And then the T comes from a Bernoulli with parameter tau. A comes from a Bernoulli with parameter, uh, with actually four different parameters. Okay, why does it have four different parameters? Yeah, so it, A depends on the value of H and T. So whatever the value of H and T are is going to give you a different parameter alpha. So if they're both 0, then, then you get back alpha 0, 0. If one of them is 1 and the other is 0, then you get back uh, alpha uh, 1, 0, and so on. You have four options there. Okay. And lastly, uh, the random variable C here uh, has no parameters. It's just uh, a function of uh, the random variable a. Okay, so draw a uniform from one to six. Add a times a uniform from one to six. Okay, so we could draw uh, from p star or p of uh, uh, the the probability distribution with theta star. Uh, a collection of training examples. Here I drew 12 of them. And uh, now that we have this data, each of these is a separate training example. And if we want to come up with the maximum likelihood estimates, then what do we do? We go through that same process that we just saw on the slide. We, we write down the log likelihood. Okay. And then from there, once we actually have the log likelihood, we can uh, substitute the joint distribution of th, a, and c uh, with the four terms. So what that means is that now uh, the log likelihood consists of a summation over the 12 training examples, but then there's one term for each of uh, the individual distributions. So what we want to do is find the values of eta, tau, and alpha that maximize this log likelihood. And to do that, all we need to do is pick the value eta hat that maximizes the log probability of hi given eta for those 12 different training examples. OK, so let's think about what that would be. OK, so here we're saying that we want to maximize the log probability of this Bernoulli valued random variable h. And we have training examples that consist of this column of values. Okay. So this is just maximum likelihood estimation of a Bernoulli valued random variable. Okay. So the maximum likelihood estimate in this case is just going to be uh, the number of times that the random variable, let's do I have that backwards? Yeah, it looks like I have that backwards. That the random variable h is equal to 1 divided by the total number of training examples. Okay. Pretty simple. The exact same process gets us uh, the value for tau, or tau hat here. Okay. So for 
eight a hat, if we actually counted these up, there's 12 examples, and one, two, three, four of them are ones. And so eta hat must be 4 twelfths, uh, which simplifies to 1 third. Okay. And then if we look at the, the t column, uh, half of them are ones, half of them are zeros. So tau hat is 1 hat. Okay, alpha hat is the more interesting one, because now uh, we don't just look at one column. We actually have to look at three columns together. Okay. The T, the H, and the A column. And in order to find alpha hat here, we need to find the four parameters alpha TH that maximize this log likelihood. And to get that, uh, we're just going to count up for each value of T and H the number of times that A was equal to 1 for that particular value of T and H and divide by the number of cases uh, where T and H took on that value. And so the result is, say, if we wanted to take an example, when T is equal to 0 and H is equal to 1, uh, it looks like we have uh, three such examples right in here for that case. And of those three examples, one of them has the value a equals 1. Okay, So we get 1 third for that parameter. OK. So, uh, so basically, learning a Bayesian network boils down to some very simple maximum likelihood estimation. And as long as you uh, know how to do maximum likelihood estimation, for the individual, for the conditional probability that you chose in your parameterization, then uh, it's easy to to actually solve this maximum likelihood estimation problem for your base net. Okay. So, uh, does anyone know? Uh, say, say I had uh, changed one of these random variables to be real valued. Like, say we changed c to be. Um, well, it doesn't really make sense, but a Gaussian random variable, I guess maybe we can have 911 phone calls taken away or something if they're negative. Um, and so if, if that were the case, then uh, what would the maximum likelihood estimate look like if we just had this, uh, this Gaussian distribution for C? Yeah, we would just look at the empirical mean and the empirical standard deviation or variance. And that would that would give us back the appropriate parameters. And maybe if it conditioned on A, it might have two means and two variances for the different values of A, for example. Okay. okay. So the Gaussian doesn't really make sense because we can go negative. Does anyone have a probability distribution that they'd prefer? If we were trying to have a, a model that captured the number of uh, phone calls, yeah, like a Poisson distribution would be nice, right? So now we actually get an integer number of phone calls, and it can't, and it's going to be also a non-negative uh, number from which we that we sample from that Poisson distribution. Okay, so um, we'll talk a lot about inference. Uh, I just kind of wanted to highlight some problems that you might want to solve once you have. A base net. Okay, so one would be how do we actually compute the probability for a specific assignment to the variables? Uh, another would be how do we draw a sample from the joint distribution? Another would be how do we actually compute the marginal probability of a, of a specific random variable where we sum over the values of all the other ones? Uh, we could also ask how do we draw samples? from a conditional distribution where we've observed some of the variables, but not all of them. This is going to prove to be very important. And then how do we compute conditional marginal probabilities where we've observed some of them and we marginalize over the others? So these are going to be problems that uh, we'll solve uh, soon. OK, so uh, for Bayes nets, uh, it's useful to be able to kind of identify what the conditional independences are. But what's funny about this is we just spent all this time defining Bayesian networks, uh, but we did so by articulating what the graph structure was. 
and then what the joint distribution was based on that graph structure. Okay. So now we're going to talk about conditional independence assumptions. And so the first thing to note is just that, uh, so by the very definition of the Bayes net, uh, we have that, oh, so this is just sort of a typo on the slide. So we have that the joint distribution of the variables x1 to xn is given by the product of uh, the probability of xi conditioned on the parents of xi. And uh, what that's saying is that uh, assuming an appropriate ordering of the variables x1 to xn, we have that uh, xi must be conditionally independent of all of the ancestors of xi uh, given its parents. Right? So what does this actually look like? Uh, so if we had some Bayesian <coughs> network that looked like this, and And what we wanted to know was uh, the conditional independence assumption uh, that applies to this center variable. Okay, let's call this A. Then we could say that uh, if these are B, C, uh, D, E, F, and G, we could say that um, A is conditionally independent of the set D, E, F, and G given the values of B and C. Okay. So if we know the values of the parents, then A is conditionally independent of all of its uh, non-descendants. Okay, so there's sort of three cases that we care a lot about, which are uh, this cascade of variables, this common parent configuration, and the V structure. And what we find is that if you know the value of Y, uh, then in this case, X and Z are independent, and in this case, X and Z are independent. But in this third case, they're not. So here, knowing Y actually decouples the values of X and Z, whereas here, knowing Y couples them together. So we're going to skip the proofs of these. Um, and uh, what I want to highlight is just that there's, there's this interesting uh, case that arises, uh, which is um, uh, that of explaining away. So uh, let's just think about this for a second. Um, so your house has a twitchy burglar alarm and that sometimes is triggered by burglars and sometimes is triggered by earthquakes. Right? And so uh, we could say that Earth arguably doesn't care whether your house is currently being burgled. And so while you're on vacation, one of your neighbors calls and tells you that your house alarm is actually going off. Okay, so uh, what do you conclude? Well, um, we could look at this from a conditional independence perspective. We, like, we could specifically ask the question, is burglar independent of earthquake, given that you got that phone call? So how many of you would say, uh, yes, this conditional independence uh, holds? And how many of you would say, no, it does not hold? many of you didn't raise your hand because you're not sure? Okay. So, uh, so what's going on here is, 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 is this prop, uh, property of explaining away. And I really need to, uh, I need to like go read uh, the PowerPoint. Um, nope. Like the PowerPoint documentation or something to figure out uh, why they changed 
my ability to jump to hidden slides. Okay, so. Um, okay, so now I want you to imagine that you're uh, you're looking on Twitter and you realize like all your neighbors are also talking about this earthquake that just hit your neighborhood, and um, and so you know you take this sigh of relief and you say, oh, it must not have been a burglar. Okay, so what's happening is, as soon as you know about the earthquake, uh, it's sort of explaining away the possibility of a burglar. And this is actually a technical term, this notion of explaining away. Uh, what it's saying is that it must not be the case that burglar and earthquake are conditionally independent given the phone call. So uh, we would say that uh, the burglar and earthquake random variables are independent, but not when you know the value of phone call. Okay. But, but you can also have like a scenario where there's an earthquake and there's a burglar, and both of them could happen, right? So in that case, they're like still independent. They're not related. So having an earthquake does not explain away that scenario. Yes. So the point is that the uh, that once you know uh, that the earthquake happened, intuitively anyway, your distribution over the probability of a burglar burgling has changed. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And so that's that's what we care about here. Okay. So it's um, not zero, but like it's changed. So you might be wrong, right? It's entirely possible that like you know the earthquake happens and then like you get home and you know your big screen TV is gone because there was actually some. Uh, non-zero probability that the burglar happened to be burgling your house at the exact moment uh, of the earthquake. Smart burglar. <laughs> um, so, okay. So, uh, I highlight those three uh, cases uh, because they allow us to start talking about the conditional independence assumptions that exist in uh, the Bayesian network beyond what we can just infer from uh, this simple uh, notion that we're conditionally independent of uh, the non-descendants given the parents. Okay. So specifically, what we find is that uh, one notion of conditional independence comes from the Markov blanket. And we find that, uh, oh, so a quick definition, the co-parents of a node are the parents of its children. And so we can define something called a Markov blanket, which is just uh, the for, for a specific node, it's the set containing the node's parents, children, and co-parents. So uh, for example, if we wanted the Markov blanket of x6, that would be its parents, x3 and x4, its children, x9 and x10, and its co-parents, which are x5 and x8. And once we have this Markov blanket, uh, we can actually say, well, a node is conditionally independent of every other node in the graph given its Markov blanket. OK. OK. So, um, so far, uh, we've seen uh, sort of two cases here. One is this sort of explaining away uh, example. Or I guess we've seen three, right? One is the explaining away, one is the three cases, and one is the Markov blanket. But what if you wanted to sort of find all possible conditional independencies in a Bayes net? Okay. Figuring them out is actually non-trivial. To figure them out, you need essentially an algorithm to do it, and uh, or at least a, a very uh, algorithmic definition. And so uh, here, we introduce this concept of de-separation to get at exactly this set of conditional independencies. So we say that if two random variables, x and z, are de-separated given a set of variables e, then x and z are conditionally independent given the set. So now we just need a definition of uh, de-separated. So uh, essentially what we have is variables x and z are de-separated given a set of evidence variables e if every path from x to z is blocked. Okay. And by blocked here, we essentially sort of mean that um, once you know the set e, it sort of prevents information flow from one side of the graph to the other, 
from the x side to the z side. Yeah. Um, so going back to the um, coupled example with the burglar and the alarm, so yeah. there was no path from the burglar to the alarm, and yet when knowing the phone call, they became coupled. So like, can you kind of explain that in context of blocking? Information? Yeah. So let's look at uh, a very specific notion of blocking. So we, we say a path is blocked in three cases. These correspond to those three little cases that I just had highlighted on the slide. Right? The first one is the, uh, the single parent case. The second is the cascade case. And the second is the single child case. OK, so what we're looking at is uh, a path is blocked between those two nodes if there's a common parent configuration on the path and you observe why. Okay. It's also blocked if there's a cascade configuration and you observe why. It's also blocked if, and this is the funny one, there's a uh, V structure where Y is not observed. Okay, so now let's jump back to our explaining away example. So here, what we said was uh, we're going to observe phone calls. So this is shaded in. But alarm is not. Okay. And so what happens is, if we want a path from burglar to earthquake, it's going to have to go through alarm. Well, those three random variables form the V structure. And in this case, we did not observe alarm. And so uh, the path is blocked. OK. So back to deseparation. Here, we're basically saying, uh, there was only one path, it corresponded to this third case, and it was blocked. Okay, so now the question is, uh, what would happen if we had uh, observed the actual alarm event? So let me just make the statement. So if we don't observe the alarm event, we say that uh, x and z are deseparated. The path is blocked. Okay. And uh, so then uh, they're conditionally independent. Oh, sorry, the other way around. Uh, so, if there, if we're, if here our set of variables e is the the phone call, right? Then in that case, uh, they are deseparated, and so they uh, are. Right, I'm, I'm saying this backwards. So if we observe the set of random variables e corresponding to the phone call then the path is, let's go back here. Here we go. So if this is E, right, and this is X and Z, right, so if we observe E, uh, the path is blocked. So, Wait a minute. Do I have this backwards or something? Uh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm missing the word "not" on this slide. <laughs> so, uh, we say that I guess x and z are deseparated, given a set of evidence variables. If every path from x to z is not blocked. No, that's also not right. I think the first two cases are blocked, and the last case is not blocked. The phone call opens up the path because it's a descendant of the alarm okay. in the first case. Uh, but then we still don't have an actual path except through alarm. Right? So according to my definition here, then uh, we have 
the actual V structure should be blocking a, a phone call from, or a burglar from earthquake. It's not belong to the so when the observe the case three uh -huh. or oh oh sorry I, you're saying because uh, there exists a Y on the path such that yes thank you uh, <laughs> I missed the key part of this definition. So there exists a y on the path such that uh, y and the descendants of y are not in the effort step. Thank you. So, uh, so the key that I was missing is that if you observe, let's just draw it on this slide. So if you actually observe, so let's say this is uh, e and this is y, and this is x, and this is z. Okay. So what we're saying is, uh, if you observe e, now e is a descendant of y, and so this third case doesn't apply uh, because the descent, one of the descendants of y is actually in that evidence set. Thanks. Okay. So the point of this is that these nets have these like completely non-intuitive conditional independence assumptions. Even to like get them uh, get them right, you need like this long explanation on a slide just to describe how you could possibly compute conditional independence assumptions. So the reason for that is that we started with the graph and we came up with the joint distribution. And then we had to kind of backtrack to come up with some complicated algorithm. It's actually not that complicated. It's, it's a nice little algorithm uh, for finding these conditional independence assumptions. But you would sort of retroactively need to prove that the, this notion of blocking is actually giving you back conditional independence assumptions. It's a nice little exercise. OK. Um, so here's another definition of deseparation. OK, so we say that variables x and z are deseparated given a set of evidence variables e if there does not exist a path in the undirected ancestral moral graph without e removed. OK, so what on earth does this mean? So the ancestral graph uh, is where you only keep uh, x, z, and e and their ancestors. So here, our example query is going to be a is independent of b given b and e. Okay. So that means we get to drop f, okay, because it's not in the ancestral graph. And then uh, we moralize it by adding an undirected edge between all pairs of each node's parents. This comes from, uh, I guess, the antiquated notion that one should only have a child uh, in wedlock. Okay, so now we're moralized. And uh, finally, uh, we convert it to an undirected graph by making all of those, just taking the arrows away. Okay. And lastly, we delete any nodes in E. This is exactly the, the case that I was missing in the previous definition. And this is how we end up with uh, the conditional independence uh, in, in that previous example, the burglar example. Okay. Okay, so, so two totally different ways of coming up with D separation. And... Um, so on the one hand, uh, I want you to be convinced that like figuring out these conditional independencies is actually pretty easy. You just kind of need to uh, remember these little tricks. But on the other hand, I want it to feel a little bit complicated. OK, why is that? Because undirected graphical models make all of this so much easier. Okay. So let's talk about undirected graphical models. Uh, to get there, uh, we're going to jump uh, from directed to undirected, and then we're going to come back and talk about factor graphs, which will tie the two together. Okay. Okay. So in general, the key concepts that you should keep in mind here are that a graphical model is defining a family of probability distributions, and that family shares in common a set of conditional independence assumptions. Okay. 
And by choosing some parameterization of the graphical model, we actually obtain a single model from the family. And the model could either be locally or globally normalized. So for a Bayes net, uh, the family of probability distributions is uh, just this notion of uh, P of X is equal to the product over all variable, this is some vector X, of P of Xi given X sub, let's say, pi I, where pi I is the set of parents of I. And then the conditional independencies, well, they come from something complicated like deseparation. An example of parameterization, well, we talked about a bunch, conditional probability tables, uh, maybe some Gaussians, uh, something else. Uh, and here, normalization, uh, these are always locally normalized models. So uh, what we can do is fill this table in for undirected graphical models and factor graphs. But, we, uh, but to do that, we actually kind of need some notion of what they are. Okay? And what I want to highlight here is that for directed graphical models, we started with the definition of the family and then figured out the conditional independence assumptions. For undirected, let's start with the conditional independence assumptions and then go back and define the actual family the joint distribution. Okay. okay. So to do that, um, let's, uh, we're going to need various different definitions. And so this is going to correspond to undirected graphical models. And uh, first, let's just kind of sketch out like a little example of a graphical model so we can refer back to it. So we'll say that uh, we have random variables that are uh, x's and they're sub-indexed by numbers. So we have x1, x2, x3, x4, and then x5, x6, and x7. And so uh, the first thing that we want here is actually a definition of conditional independence assumptions. Or we could even say conditional independence semantics for this particular type of model, an undirected one. OK, so the first thing that we want to do is we want to say uh, just a little bit of notation here, which is we're going to um, sort of purely notational, uh, but, but useful to have in place. Uh, we're going to say let x sub s okay. denote all variables uh, with indices in the set S. Okay. Maybe S could be some little calligraphic S. Okay. So uh, the reason that we want to do this is we want to now define, say, three sets of indices. So we could say let uh, A or maybe calligraphic A, be an actual index set um, and we'll define it as some subset of uh, the integer set 1, 2, 3, up to uh, say, T the number of actual random variables in our model. Okay. So up here, we're going to say t is equal to 7. 
Okay, so now that we have this notion of uh, this index set A, we could also come up with an index set B, okay, which has the same properties, and C, oh, I guess, and the one that catches the, uh, both B and C are also subsets of uh, the same index set. OK, so for an undirected graphical model, we say that uh, the following is true. Okay. So we're going to have that the set of random variables xA is conditionally independent of the set xb given xc okay, if and only if xc separates xA from xB. So what do we actually mean here by separates? Um, well, all we mean is that so separates is just the usual sort of graph theoretic notion of separation, right? So if we remove xc, uh, there is no path from uh, a node in xa to one in xb. Right? So this is a pretty simple notion. We could say, for example, that in, uh, in our graph up here, if this little blue set was xc, and this little green set up here was xa, this red set was xb, then we have that uh, the conditional independence between uh, xA and xB holds given that set xC. Because as soon as you remove that set, uh, there's no path between nodes on one side to the other. OK, so uh, there's something kind of nice going on here, which is that the notion of conditional independence in an undirected graphical model is incredibly simple. This little statement uh, is, is going to capture all of the conditional independencies that we might care about. Uh, does this mean every node in XC should be dependent on one another? Like, are the nodes in XC linked to each other? Nope. Uh, so uh, we could have done uh, a totally distinct set. Like, uh, so we could have said X2, X3, and X5 are, say, xc. Right? So now, if we did that, uh, right, if we picked these three as xc, then uh, when you remove those, any uh, sets of nodes xa and xb remaining that are disconnected from each other, for, for, for which there's no path between them, uh, are conditionally independent. Okay. And there's lots of different, now there's lots of different sets, XA and XB, that, that could give us exactly that property. Okay. So here, the conditional independence uh, semantics are actually really simple. And uh, what we want, though, is an actual definition of a joint probability distribution that preserves these conditional independence semantics. 
Okay, well, what's that going to look like? Well, to get there, we actually need some uh, graph terminology. So, I want two definitions here. The first is that of a clique. And a clique, does anyone remember what a clique is? Yeah, it's just a set of nodes that are fully connected. Okay. So here now, uh, in our example, we have um, so in this particular example, all of the cliques are actually pairwise cliques. So let's go ahead and add an extra edge here, say an edge between x2 and x3. And now all of a sudden, uh, the set of cliques just got a lot more interesting. So for example, the set x1, x2, x3 is a clique, right? They're fully connected. The set x2, x3, x4, also a clique. What if we take the union of those two sets? x1, x2, x3, x4. Is that a clique? No, because we're missing the connection between x1 and x4. Okay, okay so um, our other definition here is that of a maximal clique. So a maximal clique, or is a clique Uh, to which adding a node, adding any node, makes it no longer a clique. So it's just a clique where if you pick any other node in the graph and add it to that set, then you don't have a fully connected set. Okay. So in the case of our example here, uh, x1, x2, x3 is a maximal clique. Right? The set x1, x2 is a clique. It's a fully connected set, but it's not a maximal set because we can add x3 and get back x1, x2. Okay. So here, as an example, we have uh, both the set x1, x2 is a clique, and also, say, x1, x2, x3. Uh, but down here, we have x1, x2, x3, but not uh, x1, x2. OK. So now we're getting close. Uh, with these definitions, uh, we can move a little bit closer to the joint probability under an undirected graphical model. So uh, we define the joint probability for an undirected graphical model to be a distribution over uh, variables x1 up to, say, xt. And that joint distribution is equal to 1 over z, where we take a product and here's where things get interesting, over all cliques C in the set, calligraphic C, of cliques. And for each of those cliques, we have something called a potential function, or a factor, indexed by uh, 
Actually, let's index it by C. And it takes in a set of variables for that set C. Okay. So this definition uh, works if we say that uh, this is true where the case of uh, that calligraphic C uh, is the set of all maximal cliques. Okay. And I want to add a little caveat here. And an entry in that set. So one of the actual cliques, C, is an index set. Meaning that C is a subset of 1 up to T. Okay. So um, now let's actually uh, jump back up to our example here. So if we want to write the joint distribution uh, for this undirected graphical model, we would need to write in all the terms for all of the cliques. Okay. So we could say that P of x here, for x1 up to x7, is going to be a product of one term per maximal clique. Okay. So let's see if we can find them all. Someone want to start rattling, rattling off maximal cliques for me? So what's the first term? Yeah, x1, x2, x3. Okay, and then x2, x3, x4, good. What else? X5, X6. What's in there? Anything else? 4 and 5. And 4 and 7. Okay. Um, okay, so. Uh, my error here is that I just wrote all of these as P's, and uh, in fact, uh, we can actually prove that what I just wrote is actually completely impossible. Okay, so if we had, if we wanted all of these to be marginal distributions, uh, this couldn't possibly work. Um, possible. Okay, we actually really do need uh, to write this in terms of uh, potential functions. So it can't possibly equal that. It's got to be potential function of x1, x2, x3, and potential function of x2, x3, x4, and uh, x5 and 6, and four and five, and x4 and x7. Okay. But we're still missing something here, uh, which is uh, we want that term 1 over z to multiply all of these. So to fully specify this, we need to uh, get a few more details in here. Uh, so one of them is um, we said that we have these these terms, okay, 
and uh, they're called uh, potential functions. And we have uh, one factor in this product, uh, which is also called a potential function. per maximal clique. And uh, there's sort of uh, another key observation here, which is that uh, potential functions must be non-negative. So the actual values of the potential functions have to be uh, always 0 or greater. Okay. So for any c and xc, we have that this is greater than 0 for all c and xc. Okay. And then the, the last bit here is we have this thing called, oh, question. Oops, sorry, no, I wrote positive, but it is actually non-negative here. So it's greater than or equal to. Thank you. That's correct. Um, for the most part, uh, people actually tend to consider uh, cases where it's strictly greater than zero, uh, and we'll define, we'll give that case a specific name. It'll be called a Markov random field. Um, but in general, we actually want to define this so that it can be zero. Okay. So um, uh, this z term. is called the partition function. And the fact that we have it is what gives us a globally normalized model. So in a Bayes net, we defined these conditional probabilities and those little conditional probability tables had the property that locally they summed to 1. Here, we have something different. We're saying that uh, this distribution jointly over all of the variables is going to sum to 1. But you need the partition function to ensure that that happens. Okay. So to get there, uh, we actually have to define z to be a sum over all the possible values that that vector x could take on. Okay. And we could say this is over some calligraphic x here, which is all the possible values that x could be. And for each of those, we're going to have uh, this inner term which we could call, say, the score of a particular x vector. So in here, we have that score of x. So writing it out completely, we get a summation over uh, all of the values of x of a product over all the cliques, maximal cliques, rather. Uh, all the potential functions. Okay, so um, sorry, I jumped pretty quick there. So I'll give you guys a second just to absorb that. Any questions? Before I kind of wrap up with two more statements. Yep. 
Oh, uh, yeah. So maybe we'll we'll make this a homework problem. Because uh, I don't want to I don't want to go through it right now. But uh, can you get can you just make a note? It's a great homework problem. That this is impossible. Mar so marginal <laughs> probabilities for potential functions. Just make that note in Slack or something. Okay. Uh, so um, so this was the Markov blanket for a directed model. Uh, the Markov blanket for an undirected model is uh, just. Uh, oops. Here's a typo. Is the set containing uh, the node's neighbors? Okay. So uh, the Markov blanket for x six is just x three, x four, x nine, x ten. And we have the same property that a node is conditionally independent of every other node in the graph, uh, given this Markov blanket. And so from our original statement, this is totally obvious, right? We're just saying if x6 is the set xa, all the white nodes are xb, and the blue nodes are xc, obviously if you remove those blue nodes, x6 is now completely separated from everything else in the graph. So the notion of, uh, of ind conditional independence in these models uh, is uh, really what drives their definitions. Uh, but what's fun about them is that uh, for the direct graphical model, we started with the joint, and then it took some work to actually figure out what the conditional independences were. For the undirected graphical model, we started with the conditional independence uh, semantics, and then it actually takes some work to show that the joint distribution that we came up with uh, is the one that corresponds to those conditional independencies. So the, the point that I want to leave on is uh, that there is a non-equivalence of these two kinds of models. So, so specifically, uh, this directed graphical model does not have an undirected graphical model equivalent. And this undirected graphical model models a collection, a family, right, a collection of models, and it does not have a directed uh, model equivalent. Okay, and so what I mean here is that uh, specifically the conditional independence assumptions uh, for the, this given directed model uh, just could not possibly hold for uh, any undirected model over the same set of variables and vice versa for the undirected model. So we actually do have some important differences. And what we're going to do next time is look at uh, a notion of factor graphs which will allow us to, uh, to talk about how you can take a directed graph model and obtain a factor graph representation of it. And an undirected graphical model and obtain a factor graph representation of it. And once you do this, now we can just throw away all this uh, silly notion of arrows and, uh, and undirected edges. And we can just work in the space of these factor graphs. And we'll be able to unify uh, our inference algorithms over both kinds of original model. Uh, and we can just work in terms of these factor graphs. So that's where we're going. Okay, so we'll, we'll leave it there and uh, see you guys uh, next time. Thanks.